Welcome, dear viewers. Join us for a lecture titled Reservoir Characterization and Management by Welltest, presented by Dr. Mithat Kamal. About the lecturer, he is graduated of Cairo University and Stanford University. Over 45 years in petroleum engineering, he is the president of the Society of Petroleum Engineers International for 20 and 23. He is the author of SPE Monograph 23, a Transit Well Testing. I hope you listen it very carefully and get used to it. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I think you are ready for me to get started, right? Yes, you may begin. Thank you. I am going to uh, change my presentation to slide presentation. And uh, after I do that, I'm going to ask you again if, if you still can uh, hear me all right. Can you still all see the slides? Can you see the slide and hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, uh, one more time because that was delayed. Uh, can you all see the slide now in presentation mode? Yes, uh, everything is good right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, to talk with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased that I get a chance to talk to the students at Misan University of Misan in Iraq. Uh, and I hope I get a chance to, uh, in the future, during some of the Society of Petroleum Engineers meeting, uh, meet as many of you as uh, the chances will uh, occur. What I'm gonna be talking about uh, this afternoon is the reservoir characterization and management using well testing. And uh, let me start by uh, saying something very important that I think all of us need to recognize. Petroleum engineering is a very special branch of engineering. We are a special and we have some unique things that happen with our uh, branch of engineering that does not exist with anything else. The main thing is that we do not work with systems that we designed. We work with systems that are given to us. We did not design the oil and gas fields. We, they are given to us. Uh, unlike, for example, mechanical engineers who work with, uh, for example, the car engine that you uh, drive in today, uh, they design the, 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 the engines you know exactly what it is or a civil engineer who designed the building you are sitting in today uh, then that the petrol the civil engineer knows exactly what's in that system the system that we work with is a system that is given to us we did not design it we don't know what it is and it is very important for us to find out what it is that is what is unique about petroleum engineering and actually what is make it a very challenging and very, very uh, help, uh, nice group, uh, branch of engineering to work with. So what, what, how we actually understand that system? How do we find out what it is? We do that by actually doing uh, dynamic characterization methods. We try to find out how that system work. And the, the way we do that is that by disturbing the system and watching how the system reacts to this disturbance. And that is what well testing is about. What I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon is that I'm going to be talking with you a little bit about the specific characteristics, properties, of the reservoir that we can obtain from well tests and how do we do that? I am going to be using data 
from actual field information in order to illustrate my point. So uh, that is uh, the background that I wanted to share with you about. And then we are going to talk about uh, some of the conventional results, the results or the tests that everyone work with and find out and do that all the time. We're all going to talk about some other results. I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools that we use in order to run the tests, measure the data, and do the analysis, and then we will summarize. So how do we actually do that? We run the test, and uh, let me just give you an example. Of what, what, what do I mean by a test? We, we disturb the reservoir. So we have a well, and that well is producing oil and gas. So what we do is that we shut the well in. And when we shut the well in, we call this a build-up test. Why? Because the pressure, once we shut the well in, the pressure in the well that is not producing anymore is going to start increasing, start building up. So we call that a build-up test. Then we will look at how that pressure up with time. And we look at it and we try to understand the specific characters, the specific shape that that pressure is giving us in order to analyze the test. So let me, let me give you an example. Let's assume that we have a vertical well and that will exist in a uniform reservoir. We also assume that that well, we have fractured it. We actually have one fracture in that well, and the edge of the reservoir or the boundary is close by. And then what we're going to do, this well is, is, uh, is producing, and we are going to shut it in. So how does the pressure trace that is going to, we are going to measure, how is it going to look like? It is going to look like what you are seeing on the screen now. The red curve is actually the pressure. And as you can see on this plot, the pressure versus time. Uh, you can see also that this plot is on a log log scale. So the red curve is how the pressure would look like. The blue curve is the pressure derivative, which is it's a, it's a pressure in the red, and we are taking its derivative with respect to time to find out how is it changing, how the pressure is changing with time. That blue curve look like. You can see now that this curve that you are looking at has specific shapes and turns, and I'm going to actually explain what is these turns look like. The thing that you also yeah. need to, we need to, um, let me let me start again by saying that the red curve, uh, the red curve is actually the pressure for system as it changes with time, and the blue curve is the first derivative of that pressure with time. And I'm going to say now, uh, start looking at the different shapes that we can uh, understand from that slide. You got to understand it that when we look at the pressure change, we actually, uh, the pressure reflects the area to start with very close to the well. And as time goes by, the pressure reflects areas in the reservoir farther and farther away from the well into the reservoir. So So the first thing you are going to see uh, is, is that what seen with the green line now, this is a line that describes that that first part of the curve describes the flow inside the well bore itself. We call that a well bore storage. And it has a specific character by this uh, green line, green sloped line. And actually, that green line has a slope of one, which means that it moves one cycle on the x-axis and one cycle on the y-axis. That's the first thing we do. And from that, we can say something about the volume of the well board. The second thing that you are looking at now is what we what what. Fluid is flowing, oil or gas, is flowing from the reservoir into 
that fracture and then flowing from the fracture into the well bore. Uh, and you can see that that line has a, a slope, as you, you can see that uh, we call that bilinear flow. And from that, we can calculate something about how conductive this fracture is. Then the next line you can see here is a line that actually describes how the fluid is flowing only from the reservoir into the fracture. From that, we can calculate how long is that fracture. Now you can see after, after a while, we are going to see this line that you see it's a flat line, horizontal line. And that line actually reflects the property of the reservoir. It reflects the value of the permeability of the reservoir. That is, by the way, the most important flow regime that we always try to find when we run a test. Because it is from that flow regime that we get one of the most important parameters of the reservoir that help us in managing it, which is the permeability of the reservoir. And then uh, if we continue having the well shut in and we're measuring the pressure, then we actually are going to see another flat line that comes out at the end. You can see here that in the test that I showed you, my data does not go all the way, does not continue to go all the way. I, the test got stopped. But had we continued to run that test, we find that flat line would be, and that flat line will tell us something about how far is the boundary of the reservoir from our well. So you can see now that by looking at the different flow regimes that the test was showing us, we will be able to calculate a series of properties of the well and the fracture and the reservoir and the boundaries. And we put them one by one. And from that, we can characterize our reservoir. And from that, we're going to be able after that to be able to manage it. This is how we find out what is the system that is given to us and how we can run it. Because one more time, we did not design the system. And moreover, we cannot actually go see it. It's not like, for example, our friends, the mining engineers, who can actually drill a shaft and go down the shaft and look at their system. We cannot do that. So this is what is so unique about our work. Actually, it makes it very exciting. It's very challenging. And it's actually make it a whole lot of fun to work with it. So now I want to start talking about specific parameters that we are going to get from the test. Let me start with the most important thing, with the permeability. And in order to do that, I am going to show you data from a field. That field is an oil field. It's in Alaska, in the United States, in the, in the North Slope, in the United States of America. It's a sandstone reservoir, and it has a moderate permeability, about 20 millidarsi and so, and a modest porosity, about 22%, and things like that. And it has a thickness of about uh, 25 or to 76 meter. So we run a, a, a build-up test on that, uh, on that well, and we get the data that looks like this. So when you, when you look at the data, you, you say, okay, I want to start now, see if I can put these lines in there in order to show me where the flow regimes are. And when I put these lines, you are going to find uh, this is thing. I know it's a little bit busy, but I'm going to go over it piece by piece. First, if we go at with the first green line. By the way, can you all see my cursor? Can you see the cursor yeah, on yeah, the yeah, slide? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yes, we can see your cursor. Yes, Thank we can. You. All right. Okay. okay. So when, when, when you find that first green line, that is the line that actually describes the well bore. And then what happens, uh, I didn't mention that at the beginning because sometimes we actually have a change in the volume associated with the well. So we actually get a second line uh, also with the same unit slope. So from these two lines, we can calculate the well bore storage or the volume of the well bore, which is the top number you see in there. And then uh, with, as time goes by, we are going to actually find uh, the radial flow 
which is the blue area here, which actually describe the value of the permeability of the reservoir. What? Okay, you can see that that test, uh, we ran there, it was almost getting there, but it didn't actually go all the way there. So we're going to uh, uh, make the assumption that here, yeah, it is now not, it is now flattening out, and from that we're going to be able to calculate the value of the permeability of the reservoir. And you can see here that we're calculating a permeability of about 21 uh, millidars. The other thing that we can calculate from that looking at the test is that we can calculate the skin. The skin is the damage that exists around the wheel bore. Uh, right around the wheel bore, there is damage that comes from, for example, the drilling fluid that we use in, in drilling the well, or when fluid are flowing into the reservoir, they may actually uh, bring with them some sands and, and plug the face of the well a little bit. So that's what we call that skin. Uh, and in order to calculate the skin, we calculate that from the separation between that flat line and the pressure point. You can see this red uh, triangle on the top. The separation there, this vertical separation, from that we'll be able to calculate the value of the skin. And you can see here that we calculated a value of uh, a very slightly negative number. So we'll be able to calculate that. So once we actually identify the flow regimes with the lines like this, and then and then we say, okay, now that we identified them, and now we calculated from them an initial value for the permeability, and the, if we can actually, using these properties, use a model in order to match the entire test. And you can see what, by using... Uh, these properties, we will be able to calculate a mathemat use these numbers in a mathematical model. And you can see that this uh, solid blue line is actually saying that uh, this is what the model say. So the, the properties in the model now are characterizing, are similar to the properties in the reservoir. We're saying now that we have a model which has properties in it, similar to the properties in the reservoir, we can now go to that model and find out how we are going to be able to produce uh, the, the, the field using the properties that we have in that model. So that is how we calculate the first thing, which is uh, the permeability. Now, let me give you some a little bit information about this permeability we calculate from the well test. As you all know, there is an effective permeability and absolute permeability. Absolute permeability is a permeability if you only have one fluid in your reservoir. Effective permeability is the permeability you calculate when you have more than one fluid into your reservoir, and the effective permeability for each one of these fluids is what is described here. So what we actually calculate from our well test is the effective permeability for the flowing fluid one by one. And then uh, other important point is that you say that if my reservoir, the properties in it is, are not exactly uniform, uh, there are some variations in it, then the permeability we calculate is actually the average permeability in the area around the well that is ca get characterized by the reservoir. And uh, there are, for as I mentioned, we can calculate the effective permeability of the different fluids. So if I calculate the effective permeability to the oil, and I also calculate the effective permeability to the water, from both of these, I can actually calculate the water saturation in my well. It doesn't have to be oil and water, can be oil and gas, can be oil, gas, and water. And there is information in the literature in details that uh, you all can see that actually tell you how do you actually do this calculation when you have uh, more than one phase flowing into the reservoir. Okay, the other thing that we, we, we calculate from the test is the skin. I already have mentioned to you that in order to, cal to calculate the skin, to calculate that from the separation between the flat line that describe the radial flow and the pressure curve, the separation from which calculate uh, the skin. Uh, this is an example from a field and you can see uh, this. We, we actually, in that case, we were able to see K 
clearly the flat line. Um, uh, you can see the separation there. So uh, when we calculate the skin, one of the points I want, I, I want to make here is that uh, the skin is not a constant value. It is not like the permeability, which is a constant value, because the skin changes with time. Uh, why the skin changes time? Because, for example, the will get more damaged with time. So it changes with time. Another thing is that the skin is also can be a function of the flow rate. If if the fluid, if the flow is flowing into the reservoir at relatively low rate, what we call uh, laminar flow, then the value of the skin is not going to be affected by the flow rate. But when we go at a higher flow rate, and actually called turbulence flow, then the value of the skin will increase with the with the flow rate because the, the, the more turbulence, the more it will cause skin. So uh, let me give you an example for that. This is a field from the South China Sea. It's a sandstone gas field. It's a very has a very high permeability. 200 milli which is very high permeability, especially for gas fields. Uh, so, and then in that field, uh, which by the way, the picture you're seeing there, this is a picture of a test that was run on that in that field. Uh, actually, this test was run when the field was just discovered before. Uh, it was connected to the uh, gas pipeline. This is why the gas that was being produced was being flared, like you see in this picture. So uh, this is the test, and you can. In, what happened in this test? The red curve is the flow rate. So we actually produced the well at different flow rate. We produced at this flow rate, then we shut it in. We produced it at a higher flow rate and shut it in yet another higher flow rate, and so on, and so on. So we have diff tests at different flow rates. And for each one of these tests, we were able to calculate the skin. And when, you, when we do that, we find that here is the flow rate. On the, you can see on the x-axis. And here is the skin. And you can see as the flow rate increases, the value of the skin you calculate is increasing. That, that increase in the skin because you increase the flow rate, that is just turbulence. This is not damage to the well bore. In order to find out the actual skin, what we do with that, we, after we make a plot like this between the flow rate and the skin, we take the draw the best line and we extrapolate this line back to a flow rate of zero. And that will tell us what is the actual mechanical skin around the well bore. And in that case, you can see that we actually have the will is a little bit stimmy improved because the skin value is a negative value. The second thing that, that, that we can also calculate from the test is the reservoir pressure, which is a very important parameter because we, we run tests as we continue to produce our fields. We Every now and then we run tests in order to calculate the reservoir pressure. And we find out how the pressure is changing with time. And from that, that will allow us to find out how big the reservoir and to how to manage the reservoir. So how do we calculate the reservoir pressure? I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, this is a theoretical example. Let's say that we have a well, and then we produce this well for a while, and then we shut it in. And then when we produce the well, you can see that the pressure dropped down. And then when we shut the wheel in, the pressure, oops. And when we when we shut the wheel in, the pressure built up again. So now when we look at the data from, uh, from, from this data and make them on the plot, on the log log plot that we, we're working with. Uh, oh. Then we find out that our, our curve will gonna look like this. One more time, this is at the beginning, this is the well bore effect, and this is the transition, and now this is the radial flow from which we calculate the permeability, and one more time, from the separation, we calculate the skin. 
Now, once we see all the boundaries around the well, which is uh, very important for us to be able to calculate uh, the pressure, you find that our pressure derivative is going to drop down like that. That indicates that we are actually seeing all uh, the boundaries around the reservoir. So what we try to do is that we try to say, I'm going to get my model, and in my model, I'm going to uh, put values for the boundaries and to find out how am I actually matching. If I match that curve, then it will tell me that I actually have the boundary. And you can see here in this in this case that we when we match the curve, we found out this is a theoretical example. This is why the numbers are very nice, uh, not nice numbers, not like the numbers we get from actual field data, which they don't come to be like 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, all of them. So anyhow, and in that case, we were able to calculate, we'll be able to calculate what is the average reservoir pressure. And you can see here in the average reservoir pressure is uh, about 4,800 PSI. But what if I don't have, I did not run the test long enough in order to see this drop that actually tell me that I have seen all the boundary? What if I only stopped the test at this point? Well, in that case, what we can do is that we say, well, do I have other information that will allow me to say something about the boundaries? For example, do I know the boundaries from the geologic description of the field? And from that, I can have an estimate of all the boundaries are. I can put these estimates in my model, and I can, once I have a, the model that have the Wilbur value, and the Wilbur permeability value, and then I can put in it the value of the boundaries that I have from other form, so you can happen. So here, for example, in, 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 if that's the case, if, if I know, if I assume that I know that the boundaries, and of course, it's, one more time, it's a theoretical example, so we'll talk about 2000, you can see here, then I can actually get my model without the data here, I can get my model to extrapolate what would the pressure derivative had looked like had I extended my test for a long period of time? And you can see from that, I can calculate the value of the average reservoir pressure. So that's a, 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 another important parameter we calculate. Now, one more time, as the average reservoir pressure, we calculated how it changes with time. That will tell us how big the reservoir is and actually will help us a whole lot with managing it. What do we do with it in the future? So the average pressure that we measure is the, is the average pressure of the drainage area around the well bore. One point I like to make and 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 uh, uh, share with you because some of you some sometimes you are going to see in the literature something that's called p star, and p star happens when you say when you say I am going to assume that if I run my test to infinity, run my test for a very, very long time, my data are going to stay on that line forever, which means that I, the pressure, the way how come the pressure is increasing with time here, you can see the pressure is increasing, of course, slightly because it's in the log scale. The pressure is going to continue to increase like that for infinity. If, if that happened, that the value of the pressure that's calculated there is called P star, that you find that in the literature a lot. That value of P star, the point I want to make to all of you, is actually a mathematical number that has no physical meaning. And I'm, I recommend to you that you do not ever use that value as an approximation for the average reservoir pressure because it's usually much, much higher than what the reservoir pressure look like. Okay, the second, the, the other thing that I would like to talk about as uh, uh, information we obtain, if we have a fractured well, and then we need to be able to see if we can calculate how long is that fracture and, can, and the connectivity of that fracture. So uh, we're going to use another field example here. That's field from um, uh, the state of Texas in the United States. It's a sandstone reservoir hydraulic fractured wells. It has a low permeability. And of course, we the lower the permeability, 
the longer the fracture we need to calculate in order to help us uh, get the fluid uh, into the well bore. So uh, when we actually ran a test, uh, and if you, you, you may remember from uh, my previous very, very early slides, uh, when we ran there, this, uh, uh, here, this is the part which have the well bore, and this is the part here that actually describe uh, the fracture, describe how long the fracture is. Uh, because this is a line where we call it linear flow. It has a slope of half. If you draw a line here, you find that this line move two cycles on the x-axis and one cycle on the y-axis. From that, we can calculate the fracture length. However, in order to calculate the fracture length, when you actually go to the equation in which you are going to calculate the fracture length, you find that the value of the permeability is in this in, is in this equation. So if I don't have the permeability, I am not going to be able to calculate the length of the fracture. Where do I calculate the permeability from? If you remember, we said that after a while, this data are going to flatten out. And from the flat part, I will be able to calculate the permeability. You can see here that, of course, in this test, we didn't do that. And the more tight the reservoir, the longer it takes in order to get us to the place we calculate the fracture. So not all the time we will have the value of the permeability that we need to calculate the fracture. So in that specific case here, if, if we do the match, the match looks like this. And you can see here that this the, here we're actually reached that point because we, we assumed that there is a, or, or we knew from previous things what the permeability of the reservoir is. So we actually told the model where the permeability is. So the actual model data, you can see flattened out here. But you can see that this data flattened out at a very, very long time. It's about a thousand hours. And of course, it is very prohibitive for us to shut the wheel in to run the test for such a long period of time. Because every time we're shutting the wheel in, we are losing production and we're losing revenue. We're always trying to minimize the test. We need to get all the information we need, but we need to minimize to, to be able to minimize the test. So in order to calculate the fracture lens, we need to calculate, we need to know the permeability. Okay, so uh, let me go back here and, and talk a little bit about that. The longer the fracture, the longer the fracture, the longer we are going to stay on this line before the data flattens out. Okay, so if I have no idea what my permeability is and I want to be able to cal calculate the fracture length, it actually would be better for me if I have a very small fracture such that my data will be on that linear line for a, only a short period of time and flattens out short, early. From that, I can calculate the permeability. And once I calculate the permeability, I'll be able to calculate the fracture length. So if I need, if I have a reservoir, which is very tight, which means that I need a fracture, which is a very long fracture. But one more, you can see here the situation. If I fracture, I'm not going to be able to get the permeability. So what we do in this case is that we actually only fracture, make a very small fracture. Once I make a very small fracture and run a test, I will be able to get out of that line quickly and the data will flatten out and ca I calculate the permeability. Once now I know the permeability, I can go ahead and fracture my wheel again with the longer fracture I need in order to be able to calculate the permeability, uh, able to be able to produce the, uh, the wheel at an economic rate. So uh, this is why when we say that before you actually break the reservoir completely before you actually test it, uh, fracture it long time, you test it first and then you break it. The other point is also important to recognize is that when you create a fracture, then there is a limit for how long a fracture will help you. After a while, if you create a fracture which is longer and longer, it is not going to be helping you more and more. 
Why? Because it will become, once you go far out in the reservoir, it is as easy for the fluid to flow radially into the well as it goes to the reservoir. And in uh, the literature, we have this parameter here, which is say that the maximum fracture that will help me is fracture that I calculated. This is the permeability of the fracture times the width of the fracture divided by the permeability of the reservoir. So uh, you want to get to the point where you say, uh, for example, you work with a service company and say, we'll create a much, much longer fracture for you. Well, I don't need that. It's not going to help me anything. So we need to be aware of this information. Uh, the th next thing that I would like to talk about is that the distance to our boundaries. How do we do that from the well test? And I'm, uh, this time I'm gonna also going to uh, use a, a field example. This is a gas field uh, in the Gulf of Mexico offshore. And you can see here it's uh, 9,000 feet deep. Uh, has a high permeability again of 150 millidarcy and a, 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 a nice porosity of 21 percent and you can see here that this is that how the test look like uh, i apologize okay how the test would look like uh so one more time this is the wheel bore this is the transition from the wheel bore this flat part here tells me that this is the radial flow that permeability now, once I have once I have boundaries, uh, then you, once I have boundaries, you're gonna find that uh, the that my pressure derivative after it flattens out for the, the radial flow, it will go up and will try to flatten out again. That includes that I have a first boundary and it will go up. And if I have a <clears throat> if I have a second boundary that is. If I have a second boundary that is intersecting, I may actually find my data flat in our gate. But if I actually have, I apologize, for, but if I actually have boundaries that are parallel to each other, then we're gonna find that my data will actually go on a line that looks like this. And from that, based on the shapes of how the, the it, whether it flattens out or flattens out, or to go back on a on a on a slope like this, I'll be able to find out number one where where these boundaries are located uh, and distances to the boundary. You can see here uh, I say that I have a boundaries which are parallel to each other, so my will looks like it's side a is side a channel, and this is how how wide the channel is. So we'll be able to calculate that and. And you can see here, now if I actually get this information and try to put these numbers into my model, and I actually can see the, the model information is a solid blue line, it matches the data uh, very well. So th th that one will talk about the distance uh, to the boundary. Uh, okay, then the, the, the final thing that I would like to talk about, not the final thing, but one of the other thing I wanna talk about is the reservoir model. Uh, uh, one more time, we'll go back to uh, we'll go back to uh, the point that we are actually using working with a system that we do not know. We did not design. I'm trying to characterize that system. So uh, I'm going to explain to you a little bit more when I will go to this example. Again, that's another example. It's a gas well in South Texas, uh, low permeability reservoir. And when we run the test, you can see here. Uh, this is what the well bore. This is the transition. This is the part that has the radial flow or the formation. Then you can see that the derivative went up and flattened out, trying to flatten out again. Okay, just like I explained in the previous segment, that tell me that I have a boundary here. Okay, so that is a, a case where I say, okay, I have a I have a, a well and I have a boundary next to the well. Well not too fast because there are some other reservoir descriptions that will also give me the same will also give me the same stress of pressure although they are not for a case where i have a boundary next to the well bore that for example if i have a reservoir uh, 
that is made of a fractured, the rock itself is a naturally fractured rock. It is, it is not a homogeneous rock like sandstone. It's a naturally fractured rock like, like most of the limestone carbonates. In that case, I'm also going to get exactly the same curve, the same shape as the shape you are looking at here. So you can look at, for example, in this specific example, if I analyze this data, assuming that I have a, a, a reservoir which has a homogeneous reservoir and I have a boundaries next to the well, you can see that my calculations say, yeah, I have two boundaries, one of them to the east of the well and one of them to the north of the well. And you can see they are very cl relatively close to the well. And from that, I get that. But if I also do this analysis, assuming that I actually have a naturally fractured reservoir, you can see that I'm getting a, a, also a very nice, also a very nice match. But actually, I'm looking at a completely different reservoir, which has uh, the numbers here, omega and lambda. These are numbers that describe uh, how the fracture and the, the, the metrics of the reservoir are handling with each other. And I'm going to tell you a little story here so you can actually remember that case. Uh, before people discovered that when I have a naturally fractured reservoir, you can get the same behavior as the behavior you're seeing if you have boundaries. Before people discover that, everybody was thinking about that whenever we see this behavior, this behavior indicates that we have boundaries. And there were these two young petroleum engineers analyzing data from a field that was disco discovered in the state of Oklahoma in the United States long time ago. And they analyzed the data from the test and they found out that, uh, yeah, there is a boundary uh, about, uh, I think, uh, I remember the number, right? Something like about 150 feet away from the well. And they, they, they drill a second well in the reservoir and they analyze the data and also uh, a boundary 150 feet from the well. Every time they drill any well in the reservoir and they run a test, the data comes and it says, we have a boundary 150 feet away from the reservoir. Of course, we recognize this is not uh, plausible. This is not possible. That everywhere in the reservoir is boundary. There cannot be that many boundaries. And at that time, when people started thinking, maybe there is another model that will give us the same behavior, but it is not a bounded reservoir. It is uh, what we call <clears throat> the naturally fractured or the double porosity reservoir. These two young engineers, their name was Warren and Root. And if you look in the literature, you are going to find a whole lot of discussion about the Warren and Root model. This is a model that say that we can actually have data uh, that, uh, from naturally fractured reservoirs that have the same behavior as bounded reservoir. So <clears throat> what does that mean then? It means that whenever we look at the test by itself, like this, we cannot, just by looking at the test, we cannot determine which one it is. We need additional information, most probably from, from knowledge of the geology of the field or from the information we got from the geophysics data. We need additional information or our knowledge of what's in the basin. We need additional information in order to allow us to find out exactly what it is. That is the other part of petroleum engineering, which he says, we do not work in a vacuum. We work together with our other colleagues, the geoscientists, in order to be able to have the complete picture and actually give information that is correct, that allow us to do the proper way of, of uh, managing our field. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, when in order to find the reservoir model, Unless you have a very simple case, you actually need to find out data from other information. Now, the, what I just described to you so far are things that people accepted normally as yeah, we do that. But then there are a, a couple of other things that I just want to uh, talk to you about. 
because the the area of well testing and the information and the technology is expanding all the time it has been all the time this is not only for well testing this is for everything we do in petroleum engineering we have been drilling and producing wells for more than 100 years now worldwide and the technology you are using is continuously increasing so uh, one of the things that of course i'm sure you all of all know now one of the important things we do is that we actually right now there are a lot of horizontal wells for all kind of reasons and uh, we need to be able to analyze this data from horizontal wells uh, this is an example i'm just going to share with you from uh, another well uh, that will also again in alaska in the united states in the north part this is from prudhoe bay prudhoe bay is the largest oil field in the Western Hemisphere, the largest oil field in the Western Hemisphere is not as large, of course, as the fields that exist in the Middle East, but it's still a very big field. And, uh, and, and, and uh, all, all what I'm, I'm, all what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that now when you are looking at analysis of data from a horizontal well, there are a whole lot more flow regimes than the flow regimes that I showed at the beginning of, of this talk about the vertical well. There are more flow regimes, but we know what they are and work on them. And I'm sure uh, all of you, if you're interested and if you have the situation, you can look at the literature and find them. This is a specific example. You can see we run the test and we were able to actually do, you can see that the match is not as good as the other matches, but that's the way it is. I mean, uh, that's the best we could do. And from that, we were able to uh, calculate other parameters, like for example, because if you have a horizontal well, you need to be able to calculate permeabilities in different directions in the reservoir, the X direction, which is the direction of the well, Y direction, the direction perpendicular to the well, and, 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 and so on and so forth. But we are able easily to, to analyze data from uh, horizontal wells like we did before. Another thing is that uh, uh, when we, we can calculate from the well test is that we can calculate something about the heterogeneity of the field. And in order to calculate heterogeneity of the field, uh, we need to actually, in that case, do tests that include more than one well. They are called multiple well tests. Uh, and multiple well tests are uh, main two types, one of them called interference tests, one of them called pulse test and, and in this case uh, other than the wells that have been talking about so far where we change the flow rate and measure the pressure in the same well in that case we change the flow rate in one well and measure how the pressure is changing in an offset well in a well next to it and from that we will be able to see number one if these two wells are communicating with each other and we also will be able to tell something about uh, how the how the aerial that changes in the properties of the reservoir exist. Uh, this field here is actually field from the Arabian Gulf. Uh, and you can see it's a carbonate field. Uh, it has a very high, very, very high permeability. Okay, typical to the stuff uh, that we have, uh, <coughs> typical to the stuff that we have in the, uh, in the Middle East. Um, long, long, long time ago, when I was in a school, like uh, like you all are uh, i spent one summer interning with uh, i was i was a student as uh, our host introduced me at the beginning i was a student at Cairo university but i spent one summer interning with uh, kuwait oil company and uh, <clears throat> uh, they actually uh, sent me during my training to uh, attend a fracturing, we were fracturing a well north of Kuwait, actually very close to the border of Iraq, almost in Iraq. Uh, I, I apologize, I don't remember the name of the field right now. That's, that's a while back, guys, when I was uh, as, as young as you are now. Uh, so anyhow, and, and, um, uh, and I remember that we were actually having very high permeability uh, reservoir that one probably the highest primary reservoir i ever worked with and, and yeah, so so uh, this example here is from uh, the arabian gulf again this why uh, the high permeability there 
And we actually uh, ran tests where we uh, uh, ch changed the flow rate here, and we actually measured uh, the pressure at the surrounding wells. And from that, we tried to match the data, and by matching the data, try to find out what we have. So here's what the, what the data, matching the data look like. Uh, you can see that uh, if you assume that you have a, uh, a permeability of uh, uh, 1,500 millidarcy, then you will get uh, the data will actually will look like this. If you actually assume that you have a permeability of 4,000 4, millidarcy, your data would look like this. If you assume that you have a permeability of about 2450, then the data would look like this dark blue dots. The actual field data are uh, that purple curve. So you can see now that by doing that, we were able to uh, say that the permeability of the reservoir is very close to 2450. More important, when you actually run tests like this, you will be able to say something about the porosity of the reservoir. This is the only time in well testing you're able to calculate the porosity of the reservoir. Uh, by running tests, multiple well tests, we cannot calculate permeabilities from the reservoir when getting single well tests. Uh, uh, that's, the reason for that is beyond the scope of this discussion, but just please keep that in mind. So, uh, so I just give you an example. Uh, I know that I'm running out of time quickly, so I'm going to finish up. So we have tools that we use in the test. We have pressure gauges. Uh, uh, we have pressure gauges. We have flow rate meters. We can shut shut the well down hole, and we actually uh, we have wireline formation tests, and of course we have computers to do analysis. Uh, very important thing is that. Uh, in order to be able to get the information you need, you need to design your test right to say, I know exactly how long I'm going to run the test, when am I going to shut it in, what kind of tools I'm going to use, and uh, you need to be able to do that in order to, to actually get the correct one. One of the most important thing that I always uh, have to say in any meeting, as engineers, our number one priority is safety. Whenever you're running any test, especially when you're talking about flowing flam flammable fluids, whenever you, before you, you have pipelines to flow them in, like the example I showed you with the flare in the South China Sea, it's very important that if all the safety precautions are taken in order to make sure that we protect people and protect the environment and protect uh, the equipment. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, uh, I'm having here acknowledgement of my colleagues who worked with me in developing all these uh, cases that you are looking at. Uh, so uh, one of the main points that I would like to make is that when you talk about well test and you ask yourself, what can I get from the well test? That's really not the question to ask. The question to ask is that knowing what I know about the technology, how can I uh, design a test that will actually allow me to <coughs> get the information uh, that I need. Uh, for additional information, there are a lot of things in the literature, but one of the things that you can actually look at is monograph number 23 that uh, our host mentioned when she introduced me at the beginning. It's an SPE monograph number 23. It exists in electronic form. Uh, you can go to spe.org and, 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 and um, and get that get that information. With that, I'm going to uh, thank you, and maybe you have a couple of minutes if anybody have questions uh, before we conclude. Doctor, can 